I'm about to enter the sting zone with the bullet ant. I'm about to enter the bite zone with the leaf cutter ant. Here we are in the jungles of Costa Rica for the ultimate showdown between the two most painful ants in the world. We've got the bite of the leaf cutter ant versus the sting of the bullet ant. And I'm here to determine which of these two is the true king of pain. Before we start our face-off, we have to track down our contenders. First up are the leaf cutters, which are famous for slicing up plants and marching the pieces back to their nest. These worker ants carrying the leaves are incredibly strong, capable of lifting 20 times their own weight. They harvest these parts to use as compost that grows a fungus to feed the entire colony, including their defenders called soldier ants. Leaf cutter soldiers have no stinger at all, but instead use their massively oversized jaws like butcher knives to slice through anything standing in their way, including human flesh. I have personally witnessed a single soldier saw through skin to the bone in just a matter of seconds, and that is why it will be our first contender. To find them, all we have to do is follow this trail of ants back to their underground lair. Here we go. This is it. This is the entry point to the nest. You can see the leaves are disappearing here. Up in this clearing, there's going to be other entry points. That's where the soldiers are going to be waiting to ambush. Oh yeah, see multiple entry points. All right, we want to be very gentle with our steps around these openings because as soon as we disturb this area with vibrations, these ants are going to swarm us. These colonies can span 100 feet in diameter underground. So that's pretty much all of the visible area here in this clearing. There are millions of ants below our feet right now, including those dominant soldier ants. These are the biggest and baddest ants that you could imagine. All right, guys, get ready. So this is the same as knocking on the door. And trust me, we are not welcome. Oh, here they come right here. Look at that. Giant soldiers. If you don't pay attention, they will be all over your body. We're here to collect five soldier ants for the bite test. All right, there's one. Okay, we got one. We are getting absolutely swarmed by these ants. Look at them covering my boots. I'm to All right, this. They're I know you guys. You guys, watch yourself. Stand back a little bit. They come out of the hole with their mandibles open, ready for pain. All right, I got three. They're all over your boots. Oh, ah, oh gosh, he's already got me. Four. Oh, ah, one just got in my back. They're already up my legs. Ah, oh, God, he got me. Oh, okay. How many do we have? We got five. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Come on. I got one on my back. Yeah. Oh, I sliced my back. All right, seriously. Oh, you got them all over. You guys got them all over your boots. Oh, Matt, one just crawled in your pocket. One just crawled in your pocket. Uh -huh. Oh, Mark's right on your shoulder. Ah, he's biting me. Look at that. Uh, yeah. Yes, they could definitely bite through your clothes. Huh. There is no negotiating with these ants. They only mean to seek and destroy. It's time for round one. Let's go to the bite table and get this action started. All right. Welcome to the bite table. Here we have in our jar five soldier leaf cutter ants, and oh boy, are they angry. Let's get a closer look at the business end of one of these soldiers. Man, these ants just make you nervous. They are so incredibly strong. Let's take a closer look. Andrew, you got a good shot? It's like having a pair of garden shears on your face. They are razor sharp. We're going to attempt to recreate a swarm of ants on the top of my hand and then see if I can withstand their bites for 60 seconds. Please do not attempt to recreate what you're about to see. Matt, let's put 60 seconds on the clock. 60 seconds. All right, here we go. I'm Mark Vins and I'm about to enter the bite zone with the leaf cutter hand. Here we go, on three. One, two, three. Ah, yeah, that one's got me. Uh, all right, they're all in, start the clock. 60 seconds starting. Uh, uh, oh, they're breaking the skin. Uh, uh, man, that hurts. Oh, 
Oh, what's the time? What's the time? Ah, they're just annihilating my skin, just popping holes. Ah, oh, oh, it's like razor pinches. Ah, they're just like slicing my through my skin like butter. Ah, oh, give me a countdown. It's got to be close. All right, it's done. Nine, eight, seven, ah, six, five. Don't move your hands. Three, two, one. Get them off, get them off, get them off. God, they won't come off. Ah, they just bite harder. Get off me. Oh, that was so bad. That was so bad. Oh, ah, so many bites. That was so much more intense than I thought. I thought there was no possible way that a leaf cutter ant bite could even come close to comparing, but I don't know. Bullet ant stings up next, but that's the most uncomfortable thing I have ever experienced. The sheer willpower to just like look away and let that happen. I hope you guys got good shots because I never want to go through that ever again. All right, so let these ants go and get back on the hunt. Even with fresh wounds on my hand, there was no time for a break. My turn to face the sting of the bullet ant had arrived. Bullet ants are one of the largest ants in the world and are legendary for having the most painful sting in the insect kingdom, rating above cow killers, tarantula hawks, and the infamous murder hornet. It has also earned itself the nickname the 24-hour ant because the excruciating pain from a single sting can last an entire day. Let's let these ants back off into their nest. There you go. Round one of the most painful ant showdown is in the books. I've got some battle wounds to show for it. Now it's time for round two, the sting of the bullet ant. I've got some good news and bad news. The bad news is, for me, this is definitely gonna happen. The good news is, we don't have to go very far to find our bullet ant. Literally on top of the leaf cutter ant colony, there is a bullet ant nest right here at this tree. I have never seen this before. All I have to do, give a little knock on the door, check this out. Oh, here they come. Can you get your microphone close? Hear them making their battle cry. Oh, they're angry. We just need one ant. Here we go. Oh, we got two on there. Oh, let's see if we can get one to climb off in it. All right, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, geez, that was close. All right, we got an ant, and just like that, we are ready for round two. <sighs> the time has come for the second contender. Those leafcutter ants meant business, but those are flesh wounds. This is venom. Let's get the bullet ant out of the jar so we can get a closer look at exactly what we're dealing with here. All right, I'm just gonna let it crawl onto the table. Got it. Oh man, my heart is definitely racing a million miles a second right now. These ants are not to be taken lightly. Some ants just bite, but some ants sting. And this is the king of sting. Oh. Ah. Did you see that? Jumped right off the forceps. Let me grab it again. Be good, be good. Okay, got a better grip that time. Oh, oh man, okay. He looks angry. It's very angry. The Panera toxin in this ant stinger is ranked number one on Dr. Schmidt's sting index. And I'm not just gonna take one sting today. I'm about to take it on for 60 seconds. Oh man, this is gonna be, this is gonna be painful. Please do not attempt to try this at home. 60 seconds on the clock. Here we go, camera's rolling, camera's rolling, camera's rolling. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone for 60 seconds with the bullet ant. On three, one, two, Three. Ah! Oh, oh, you see the stinger going in? Oh, I got that shot. Oh. Ah! Oh. Oh. Oh, that hurts. Oh, the stinger's still in me. Ah! Ooh. Ah! Ah! Mark, we gotta stop the clock every time you take it. All right. Oh, man, that just, it really burns. You have to hold it on there for oh. a whole minute. Oh. Oh, yeah. You can see the stinger going in the skin. You see that? Oh, man. And he's just like working it in. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. 
Oh, 30 seconds. Ah! Ooh! Ah! Oh, the stinger's in there. He's just pumping me full of venom. Mark, you okay? Ah! Ah, uh, no! Ah, it's hot! Ah! Ah! Oh, yeah, you see the stinger going in and out? Ah, it's getting me again. Ah! What's the time? What's the time? What's the time? Ah! 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time. Oh! Oh, I'm bleeding. Where the stinger is in. You guys see that? Oh! Oh! Dude, I'm telling you what, that is searing pain. My arm is on fire right now. Uh, uh. Describe the pain. It's uh, hot. It's hot, it's pulsating, it's electric. My skin is just like rippling with pain. You can see it drew blood. The stinger was in the skin just pumping me full of venom. Do you see it pull out there at the end? That was insane. They say it's like being shot by a bullet. This pain is rumored to last for like 24 hours. The sting is getting worse by the second. So which one's Gosh. worse? The acute pain of those leaf cutter amp jaws really hurt. This is different though. This is getting worse. Like you could see the redness is starting to really flare up. Like look at all the capillaries dilating there. Wow. In terms of the showdown, I don't know. What do you guys think? What did you, you think was worse? Just based on your pain reaction and the bites, I think leaf cutter ant. I mean, this was no walk in the park. This did not feel good for a second, but those leaf cutter ants, that is something I never, ever want to go through ever again if I can help it. All right, guys, it's getting dark. Let's release the ant and head back to camp. As we made our way back to the nest to release the bullet ant, the swelling and searing pain increased dramatically. And I was starting to think that I had declared the winner of this ant vs. ant face-off far too soon. All night long, my arm was riddled in bone-crushing pain, and it took everything I had to hold back from screaming out in agony. I maybe got like two hours of sleep last night, guys. This bullet ant sting just kept me up all night long. For what it's worth, I feel my experience has proved the rumors true. The pain became much more intense before getting any better, and the visual swelling and itching alone were shocking. It took multiple days for all of my symptoms to subside. And if it were up to me, I'd rename this species the 48-hour ant. So I had to do the right thing and return to the table. Well, I for one am never too proud to admit when I am wrong. And in terms of yesterday's verdict as to which was worse, I was wrong. Look at my arm, guys. I am in so much pain right now. And look at this. The redness extends all the way from my wrist to my, almost my elbow. It truly feels like a broken bone. Wait, wait, Mark. So are you, are you changing the winner from yesterday? <sighs> no question. No question. I have never felt pain like this from a sting. This is the worst thing I have ever experienced in my life. The bullet ant is the true king of pain of this rainforest. I'm starting my search for Arizona's largest tarantula, and normally I do my best to not get bitten by giant hairy spiders, but today I'm going to intentionally take a bite from the desert blonde tarantula to see just how dangerous it really is. But before I can do that, I've got to catch one. Let's get searching. We're searching the Sonoran Desert of Arizona to find these tarantulas. This desert is teeming with all sorts of venomous creatures, and the best time to find them is after dark. The sun is finally set, headlamp is on. This headlamp is going to be the main tool that I use tonight to find one of these tarantulas. So I'm gonna use my headlamp to sweep from side to side. There's not a lot that gives away other than just getting a light right on the tarantula itself. And then comes the tricky part, actually catching one. I also have a snake hook with me tonight, which could come in handy in catching a tarantula. But the main reason I have it is because this is prime rattlesnake territory. There's a lot more things crawling around out here than just big spiders. These spiders are out tonight hunting, but if they're near their hole, they'll quickly tuck back in. If I don't get close enough in time, it's pretty much game over and we'll have to find a new tarantula to catch. Whoa, we got a rattlesnake right there. You see it coiled up? Right there. 
Back up a little bit, guys. That is a Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. Now, it is not a big one. This is a juvenile, but it is still capable of inflicting a very serious bite. You can use a snake hook to move snakes out of our way, just like this. Let the snake go, and we keep searching for spiders. Yes. It's a great sign that we're seeing all these venomous creatures out on the hunt. This desert is coming alive. Put a scorpion right at your foot. Look at this. Desert hairy scorpion right there. Let's see if I can grab it. Best way to do this is just to grab right at the top knuckle so it can't sting me. Let's see if we can get him to calm down. Stay, stay buddy, stay buddy. Come on. There we go, that's good. Oh. Got him. Oh yeah, he's pinching me. All right, here we go. Let's see if show you what we got here. That is a pretty good size giant desert hairy scorpion, the largest species of scorpion in the United States. Luckily, I've got a good grip on its stinger there, but you can see there's even a little bit of venom starting to come out of the tip of it. If you don't grab these guys correctly, they will give you a pretty good pop. You can see why they call them the desert hairy. Look at all the hairs all over its body. It doesn't get much cooler than these large scorpions. All right, let's put them back and keep looking for those tarantulas. Scorpions and tarantulas are out here hunting the same food. I have a feeling we're closing in on our giant spider. Oh, I got a spider right there. Let's go. All right, I got my container. Let's see if we can get a catch. Okay, it's holes right here. I'm going to need to move in carefully. That is a big male. Lost it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe I can coax it back out. Ah, lost it. Wait, hang on. It's still there. I got it back. I got it back. Snake hook is coming in clutch. Coax it this direction. See it rearing its abdomen up. Okay, oh, just bit the snake hook. Here we go, guys. Got it. Got it. Here we go. Woo! Oh, buddy. That is a good one. Big male desert blonde tarantula. After a little bit of searching and a little bit of luck that we brought the snake hook, we got ourselves our tarantula for the bite test. All right, I'll take it back in. Let's go, guys. Yes! As fate would have it, as we were heading back to start setting up for the bite test, we saw an even bigger spider. Oh, another tarantula. This one looks bigger. Oh yeah, okay. Let's try to catch this one too. All right, I don't know how close it is to its hole, but I'm gonna go in for the catch. Here we go. Holy cow, that is a huge freaking spider, guys. Wow. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Ho, 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 ho! That is the specimen we have been after. That is a truly huge tarantula. I did not expect this. Not one, but two huge desert blonde tarantulas. What we have here are a male and a female. And unfortunately for me, I think this video just turned from a tarantula bite test to a tarantula bite comparison. And I'm sure you are as curious as I am which of these two spiders has the more painful bite. It's time to find out. I am definitely nervous. Oh man. Oh, oh my goodness. Two full grown desert blonde tarantulas. And the table is now set for the ultimate spider bite test here in the Sonora Desert. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. What I'm about to do is a bad idea. Please do not attempt to recreate what you're about to see in this video. We have two tarantulas here in front of us. We have a male and the female, which we found unexpectedly. I think it is worth doing a bite test comparison to see which bite is more ferocious because these spiders live very different lives from each other. Females actually live for a lot longer. We're talking 25 years for a female tarantula and only five to 10 years for a male. Females tend to bunker down. They stay a lot more localized to their nests where the males are much more nomadic and predatory. I have a suspicion that we have a very different bite profile 
to these two spiders and we are going to put that to the ultimate test. Let's take a closer look at Arizona's largest spider, ladies first. In order to get some really good footage of the spider, I'm going to move it into this glass dome. And of course we don't want our spider to get away. All right, delicate little procedure here. Wow. There we go, perfect, perfect, perfect transfer. Oh my goodness. The fangs on these spiders are enormous. It's not just going to be the venom that I'm up against today. We're talking actual puncture wounds from fangs that large. In terms of what they're out here hunting and eating, pretty much anything that they can grapple onto. They are very strong spiders. And of course, possessing those large fangs, they could subdue a variety of prey, even small lizards, would be a good meal for a spider this size. The females tend to be a little bit bigger than the males. They are called a desert blonde tarantula, predominantly because you can see those hairs and just how blonde they are in the middle. But that is a full grown desert blonde tarantula. The best way to probably go about doing this is for me to grab it by its carapace, the top of the head of the spider, and I'm gonna try to pin it grab it and then I'll be able to show you the fangs and of course inflict the bite right here on my thumb. Whew. All right, um, brought a couple things with me today. I have a large pair of tweezers. Of course, we always bring first aid kit. The thing I need the most is the EpiPen. The worst outcome that can happen besides the pain that I'm about to experience is an allergic reaction. I think it's time to take the first of two bites from a tarantula. Okay, here we go. Now the females are known for being a little more docile than the males. Beyond, oh, easy girl, easy girl. Back, back, back. So you see how it's rearing its abdomen up right there? Beyond their capability to inflict bites, they also possess another defense mechanism, which is to flick the hairs off their abdomen. Females are rumored to be less aggressive, but this one looks ready to bite. And what I'm trying to do right now is to get a good hold on the carapace. This is the safest way for me to hold it for both me and the tarantula. There we go. Oh, geez. Okay. That was, that, that made my heart go. Okay. The spider just wants to come right at me. Oh my gosh. Did you hear that? That is the sound of spider fangs scraping the table. Okay. Look at the size of those fangs. And their fangs are retractable, just like a snake. And they are thick. We're talking some very large fangs. Those are going to pop holes in my skin for sure. <sighs> I've got to get a lot of nerve to do this. Okay, I've got a good grip on the spider. I'm gonna go for it on three. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to take a bite from Arizona's largest spider, the desert blonde tarantula. On three. One. So nervous. Two. Three. Spider's fangs are on my skin. Ah! Yep, got me. You can see there's a little blood right there. Only popped one fang through. I don't think I gotta take a better bite, guys. It wasn't a good enough bite. All right, I'm gonna do one more. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Ah! Yeah, that, that time it got me. That time it got me good. Oh my God. That freaked me out. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hang on, let me get the spider back. Get back in there, girl. Get back in there. Ah. Uh, yeah, see right there. See that? <sighs> Definitely burns. Oh my gosh, my adrenaline is like firing right now, guys. I, I feel like my soul uh. just jumped out of my body. That is the freak, most freaked out I've been around an animal. Uh. And it definitely burns. Oh man. 
My neck, okay? yeah. My neck is like seized up. It's like I've got a cramp right here. I don't know if it's from the bite or if it's from just the nerves and the tension. Oh my gosh. I think it's nerves. I, I don't think it's from the venom. <sighs> definitely burns. It's, a, it's definitely a burning sensation. I had to really try hard to get that spider to bite me. I want to point that out that this this spider did not want to bite, but that was not an aggression bite for sure. Okay. I think I'm I'm good enough to do another bite. I think it's time to bring in the second tarantula and see if the male can inflict a more aggressive bite wound, which I have a feeling that's going to happen. Males are known to be more aggressive, and that's why I wanted to do a bite test here much darker in coloration than the female too. Not looking forward to this. And my hand still burns from that first bite. Okay, come here. Come here, you. Come here, you. Okay. Got a pin. Oh my gosh. Way stronger. Way stronger. Way more aggressive. Look at it attacking. Oh boy, that was tough. Okay, there you have it. The male desert blonde tarantula. Here are the fangs. You can see just as terrifying as the female spider. And you can see there's even venom on these. Okay, on three. I'm about to take my second bite, this time from a male and much more aggressive desert blonde tarantula. On three. One, two, three. Just waiting for the bite to come. You see, he does not want to bite me. It's not as angry as the female. No. Big reaction is that these, these animals do not want to bite me. So while we've given this spider plenty of opportunity to inflict a bite, you can see it really has no intent to do me any harm. And frankly, it should be a lot more afraid of me than I am of it. So I hope after watching this video, we all have learned some important lessons about Arizona's largest spider. Even though these spiders are large and admittedly pretty creepy, you really have no reason to fear them. And honestly, their venom isn't that strong because spiders this large tend to use their strength to overtake their prey. They don't want to bite you. And even if they do, it's really not that bad. All right, let's let our spiders back off into the desert. What's going on, everybody? I'm Mark Vins. Today, we're back in Costa Rica for another special adventure brought to you by our friends at B&H Photo. And I'm particularly excited for today's adventure because we are looking for one of my all-time favorite land animals, the poison frog. And not just one poison frog, two poison frogs, the strawberry poison frog, and my personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. And the reason I wanna find and present these frogs to you today is because I wanna talk about just how toxic and dangerous these frogs really are. And Mario is gonna give a special demonstration on how we get those really cool macro shots of a small creature like a poison frog. But first things first, we have to find some. Today we're gonna to search just around our lodge here because this whole site is full of bromeliad plants and those are perfect breeding habitats for these species of frogs. So they tend to hang out pretty close by. As a matter of fact, I hear one right now. I'm gonna film on the GoPro, you guys follow me, and with any luck, we're gonna catch two frogs really quickly. Okay, I think what I heard was actually the strawberry poison frog, also called the pomelio. And I heard it coming from right over here. Oh, there he was. I saw him right there. I'm gonna try to not disturb the habitat too much. Ah, this one might have gotten away. So the frogs do have burrows in these masses and they have really great escape routes. They're particularly hard to catch too because they jump with a non-rhythmic motion, which means uh, they don't really have any synchronization at all to the way they hop. That was our first miss, but we did see a strawberry poison frog there. Let's keep looking. We are in the right spot. So these frogs are terrestrial, so what we're looking for are low-hanging branches and leaves that they can find cover around, and that's typically where you find these poison frogs. Oh, got one, got one. There he is. Oh, I fell. Don't move, don't move, it's right here. I'm gonna let it work its way out, and I'm gonna go for the grab. Ready, got a shot? 
Got him. Woo! <laughs> All right. Ready for this? Here we go. Strawberry poison frog. We got one. All right. That's part one of two of today's adventure. Next up, the green and black poison frog, which is a little bit more difficult to catch than this one. So for now, let's, uh, let's get a container. I'm going to make a little micro habitat for this frog for a little bit. Some cover so it feels comfortable. There we go. All right, let's go find a green and black poison frog. All right, good news, bad news. The good news is we caught the first frog we were after today, the strawberry poison frog, and a really good one too. The bad news is we're in the rainforest and that means sometimes it's gonna rain. And there is a rainstorm coming in right now, so we're gonna let this shower pass by. There is a little blessing in disguise. This moisture is probably gonna bring out some of the frogs we're looking for. So all we have to do is wait a little while and then we'll be back at it trying to find the green and black poison frog. All right, taking a quick break. So the rainstorm has passed by, which is good news. Also good news because all of a sudden the rainforest has come to life. We're hearing tons of frogs calling right now. Can you hear that? I can hear about six or seven different species distinctively right now that I wasn't hearing before. So this is a really good sign that we may come across that green and black poison frog a little sooner than we thought. Now the call of the strawberry poison frog is a little more distinct and a little louder. It's like a rip, 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 rip kind of sound. The uh, green and black poison frog is a duller kind of and it's definitely a lot less audible. So we're gonna have to listen as we search along this edge. So unlike the uh, strawberry poison frog, which I was able to sneak right up on and catch, the green and black poison frog is definitely more elusive and shy. So I'm gonna have to be looking a lot further ahead than the other species. I've actually never caught a green and black poison frog myself. So this is a pretty special day for me. This is my absolute favorite species of poison frog. I've been obsessed with these creatures since I was in third grade. Um, and this is really a dream come true to be out here today in Costa Rica, finally getting hands on with one of my favorite animals, if I'm lucky. Okay, nothing here. Let's keep moving this way. Wait a second. I heard one. It's gone. So faint, I heard it for just a second. Let's move over this way. There's one. Where? Big one, right there. It's right here. One. Yep. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. Got him! Ha <laughs> ha! Oh man, all right, I don't wanna lose him. Let's go back over here. This is a big deal. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> no! Got him, got him, got him, let's get away. Oh man, this is a big moment. My first ever green and black poison frog. Look at that. I have been dreaming of this moment since I was nine years old. Look at how beautiful that frog is. Now we have both poison frogs that we wanna take a closer look at today. Let's put this one in a container and take a look at both species side by side. Coyote's not the only one who bleeds. I bleed blood. That whole bush that I just caught the poison frog in is full of uh, spotty plants. Ouch. Woo! Okay. Well, there we have it. Poison frog versus poison frog. We are gonna take a quick look at the differences between these two species before we get into the macro photography. So first things first, it's pretty obvious that we have a size difference here. The strawberry poison frog is more often than not a lot smaller than the green and black poison frog. We can also notice they have very distinct coloration differences. And I have to say, look at how beautiful these two poison frogs are. They truly are the jewels of the rainforest. Now, they don't just look this way to impress us. There's actually a reason why these frogs display the colorations that they do. This is what's called aposomatic coloration, which is a warning sign to predators that says, don't eat me, because if you do, you're gonna eat a whole mouthful of toxins that I have in my skin. Now, we're gonna get to how toxic these two creatures are in just a minute, but before we do, let's talk about a couple other differences in behavior. So they parent in very different ways. The strawberry poison frog, which genus is Ophega, which means egg eater, actually takes their tadpoles once they're hatched out of the egg, deposit them in a small reservoir of water. This can be in a bromeliad plant, this can be in an empty coconut husk, this can be in a hollowed out log. And once the tadpoles are in there, 
the female will go and deposit unfertilized eggs to feed their offspring. And this is the primary food source for these tadpoles until they reach maturity and become frogs. With the green and black poison frog, their parenting is a little bit different. The male will actually carry the tadpoles on its back to a water reservoir like a bromeliad or a hollowed out log, and they will deposit the tadpoles at different times. Now, because of this, the tadpoles have different stages of maturity, and while they are good parents, they're not the greatest brothers and sisters because these tadpoles, unfortunately, often cannibalize each other for resources because unlike the strawberry poison frog, which feeds on eggs from its parents, the green and black poison frog is completely reliant on its surroundings, so it's gonna eat other insect larvae, algae, and mites that might crawl around the surface. Time to answer the question you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the toxicity of these two poison frogs. Which one is more toxic? The short answer is, it's pretty hard to tell. But for human beings, both of these species are considered, get this, non-threatening. And that's exactly why I'm able to hold both of these and present them for you here today. All I need to do after this presentation is wash my hands with soap and water, and I'm going to be just fine. Now, that being said, there are varieties of poison frogs in South America that are potentially dangerous and even deadly to human beings. And we're actually gonna be going on a trip to Colombia later this year to try to find some of those. So while neither of these frogs are potentially threatening to human beings, they are both very toxic for their would-be predators. So I think we've taken a pretty good look at both of these little gems of the rainforest. And now it's time for Mario to step in and show us some of the cool tricks of the trade and how we get those awesome macro shots with some of our specialty lenses. Mario, you ready to step in? All right, let's do it. Okay, cool. Okay, so we had to make a quick move there because the sun started to come out. And uh, believe it or not, despite being toxic, these frogs are actually very, very fragile. So for the well-being of the frog, we wanted to move to the shade. And that being said, Mario, how do we get these macro shots? We're gonna be using this setup right here, which is the new Canon EOS R and our favorite lens, the macro 100 millimeter Canon L series. So in order to get these really tight shots, uh, a few things have to be in our favor, light and stability. So we like to use a nice sturdy tripod in order to get the stability we need in low light conditions. One of the reasons why we really love this 100 mil macro lens is because of its amazing image stabilization. A lot of times we may not have the most heavy duty tripod and we have to use lightweight gear. So that extra image stabilization is critical. So I'm gonna start recording. We've got this dual pixel autofocus, which means any little movement will actually be tracked. Now, unfortunately there is some movement in just holding this animal. It is very hard to keep still, but as you can see, we're already achieving that really fine detail that macro photography actually will allow. So how am I doing? Am I staying steady enough for you? You're pretty steady, but I think we are done with this guy. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the green and black. Okay, cool. Now time for the all-star. My personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. Man, nine-year-old Mark would be very, very pleased with how today's going. In, in the world of macro, uh, we went from the little strawberry dart frog to this one. Mm -hmm. This is bigger. So now I have to actually adjust a little bit, at least for the distance. Uh, we wanna get kind of its entire body in frame. That blue shirt with this contrast of the green and black looks really nice. Thank you, Mario. I'll take that as a compliment. It's amazing you could actually see its respiration Beautiful. So macro photography is definitely a team effort, especially in a situation like this where you have one person holding a specimen and one person getting the video. Great thing about these cameras, of course, is you could also get your still images from them. Okay, got both frogs back in hand. Mario, you ready to get the thumbnail? Yeah. And since this episode is a comparison of two of our favorite species of poison frog, we're gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison for the thumbnail. Let's, let's get a green background. Man, what an awesome day. Catching a strawberry poison frog is always a great day, but I have to say for myself, finding and catching my very first green and black poison frog was truly a special moment. So thank you for being here, Mario. That was Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And I do want to say a special thank you to B&H Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And here's some good news. They put together some awesome gear and deal packages just for our audience. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those deal offerings and get outside and make videos like we do. All right, let's let them go. Welcome back to Tiger Beach. 
the site of our first ever shark dive on Blue Wilderness. If you want to see sharks, like a ton of sharks, you come here. Tiger Beach is a small, pristine white sand flat about an hour's boat ride from West End Grand Bahama. And it's one of the few places on Earth where you can see up to five species of shark all at the same time. Divers who make the pilgrimage here are rewarded with the chance to swim with scores of reef and nurse sharks, dozens upon dozens of lemon sharks, and if they're lucky, massive hammerhead and tiger sharks. The last time we entered this warm, crystal clear water, we found ourselves in the middle of a shark frenzy. We swam alongside an incredible hammerhead and Coyote and I got up close and personal with a massive tiger shark. Well, maybe a little too close in the case of Coyote. So how do we top that? Well, on this episode of Blue Wilderness, we're going back in the water, but this time we're waiting until the sun goes down. All right, guys. Well, the sun is setting at Tiger Beach and we just started shark diving yesterday. Never been night diving before, but somebody thought it was a good idea we go diving with sharks at night. Was that you? Definitely was not. No, me. no, it was this guy. Oh. It's gonna be fine, you guys. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Is this a good idea for guys who haven't gone, you know, night diving at all? What's the worst that can happen? I mean, if we're surrounded by sharks. Right, but you know, they're probably sleeping. And we can't see. Wait, <laughs> don't sharks feed at night? Aren't they nocturnal predators? It's well, gonna be fine. We're gonna give it a shot, guys. So let's get geared up get in the water with the sharks at night. This dive into the darkness will test my resolve more than almost anything I've ever done before. But that's what drives me forward. At the core of every grand adventure lies a thin line between thrill and fear. And the moments where your nerves start to scream, turn around, go back, is exactly when the teammates next to you matter the most. I'll tell you what, if I was nervous about diving with sharks during the day, I'm very nervous about <laughs> diving with sharks at night. Well, in case it's the last time, I'm Mark Vins. Mario's already down there. It's time to go dive with sharks at night. As soon as we dipped below the surface, the world opened up. The last bit of twilight after sunset, combined with the white sands of Tiger Beach, allowed for a lot more visibility than we could have ever expected. But as we neared the bottom, the fleeting light that remained began to disappear. And so did our peripheral vision. Hey, Mario, watch out. There's a, yep, big tiger shark right behind you. Within minutes, the entire landscape turned pitch black, and our only field of view was directly in front of us. Other divers in the distance appeared as alien craft, with orb-like lights designating their location. With ominous shadows stirring the now murky water, we were surrounded on all sides by two things that have terrified humans since the beginning. Sharks and darkness. But our focus was sharp, and as soon as we got our bearings, our fear was gone, mostly. And then we noticed something we didn't expect to see at night, color. You see, water is excellent at absorbing color from natural light. The deeper you go, the more color disappears. Red is the first to be absorbed, then orange, and then yellow, the same order as the colors of the rainbow. At our depth during the day, the reef can look, well, pretty bland and washed out. But under the cover of night, our powerful dive lights illuminated a completely new world that had been right in front of us the entire time. Even the fish were more vibrant. And then, while we were all completely mesmerized by the colors of the reef, from out of the darkness, ghostly figures flew gracefully into view. These rays are filter-feeding fish, 
Their flight pulls plankton and other nutrients into their systems and spreads water across their gills, allowing them to breathe. Like spaceships flying across our night sky, just as fast as they appeared, they were gone. The rays may have vanished, but if there's one constant at Tiger Beach, it's, well, sharks. And more specifically, tiger sharks. We knew they were out there, but at night, we couldn't see them until they were right in front of us. They drifted in and out of our light like phantoms. The effect was chilling and surreal, and so unnerving, in fact, that I started to actually become numb to it. Here I am, sitting at the bottom of a pitch black ocean, surrounded by deadly nocturnal hunters, and I'm totally at their mercy. And then, suddenly, we came upon something that would change my perspective of sharks forever. It was a lemon shark, and it appeared to be, well, sleeping. Okay, so sharks don't actually sleep, at least not like we sleep, but some sharks, like nurse sharks or this lemon shark, go into restful periods that appear like sleep. But trust me, this shark was still wide awake and ready to defend itself against anything, including a curious first-time night diver. But did that stop me? Nope. This would be the perfect opportunity to get some great close-ups of that shark. And of course, it's razor sharp teeth. Lemon sharks can grow up to 10 feet long and weigh over 400 pounds. But despite their imposing size, they tend to be gentle giants and are not responsible for any known human fatalities. Although, like any shark, they will bite if provoked. They can be found in shallow waters and hunt with their incredible electroreceptors. And just in case you're wondering, they do have a slightly yellow tinge to their skin, you know, like a lemon. Gentle or not, I knew this sleeping giant was still an apex predator capable of inflicting life-threatening injuries. And the last thing I wanted to do was provoke it, especially at night this far from shore. But we film with grizzly bears and badgers. This was my chance. I had to get the shot. And to my surprise, I was able to lie right next to the nearly 10-foot shark. This was amazing. A life-changing experience, to say the least. And now, I would never approach a tiger shark or other top land predator like this. But laying there, beside this incredible creature, I could sense its gentle nature. And it became clear that it had accepted my presence and was allowing us to film with it. And then, I reached out, testing its trust. I couldn't believe it. It actually let me make contact. I was literally petting a shark. This chance encounter cultivated within me a growing sense of connection, not only to this creature, but to its entire aquatic realm. Swimming during the day in a frenzy of tiger sharks, and now petting a lemon shark on my first night dive reminded me of how misunderstood these animals are. Our fear of them, like our fear of the dark, is really just a fear of the unknown. Every single time we go out for a blue wilderness adventure, we've managed to see something unexpected. And this incredible dive, our first night dive, was no exception. Swimming among them and literally lying beside them in the darkness of Tiger Beach at night brought home to me more than ever how meaningful our adventures could be to better understanding the mysteries of the ocean. Ascending back to the surface, I couldn't wait to celebrate with the team what had just happened. I knew that this night would be a story that Mario and I would share for many years to come. All right, we're back and we officially survived night dive number one. 
Now, I will say guys, it was a little intimidating when we first got in the water, but once we got down there, it was absolutely incredible. We saw all kinds of cool creatures from stingrays to sea cucumbers, and we even got to pet a lemon shark. Man, I definitely can't wait until our next night diving adventure. The oceans have depended on sharks for over 400 million years. They are true survivors. And yet, many species of shark are facing overfishing and habitat destruction, leaving their populations vulnerable and on the verge of collapse. These ancient animals are certainly not the nightmarish killing machines depicted in movies. They are a critical part of our ocean's ecosystem, and we must all do our part to ensure their home, the ocean, is protected. Oh, got one. Oh yeah, woo, yeah. This, believe it or not, is one of the most famous creatures ever featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. That's right, the original Bloodworm video now has over 73 million views. But in that original adventure, we did leave a few things on the table that are definitely worth revisiting. Namely, the venomous bite of this creature. Actually, did Coyote take a bite? Ow! Oh. Yay! Did it bite you? He got me! <laughs> I got that! He got me, I oh. felt it, it was oh, a little dude. pinch. Let me see, where'd he get you? Right there, right in the crux of my finger. I think we can do better than just a pinch for one of the world's only venomous worms. In fact, we learned something very important about this creature between the last adventure and today that's going to help us achieve a bite on camera. But before I go getting myself chomped for this new bloodworm experiment, we need to find a whole lot more worms than just this one. Let's keep digging. Bloodworms hunt for prey in the tidal mudflats of both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States and Canada. They have also earned the nickname sludge worm since their habitat consists of thick mud and quicksand that can easily swallow your boots whole. To find these slimy predators, worm diggers use special rakes to quickly peel back mud and reveal worms on the move that could be sold as prize fishing bait. And while they can be difficult to find, some of the best worm diggers in Maine can collect up to 1,000 worms a day, with the largest ones growing up to 15 inches long. After hours of digging and covered head to toe in mud and sweat, we filled the bucket and set the stage for one of the worst bites we've ever filmed. Welcome to the bloodworm bite table. What I have in front of me here are five very large bloodworms. No, these are not your granddad's night crawlers, folks. These are natural born killers. Armed with four venomous fangs and an appetite to match, we have been told that these worms pack one heck of a bite. Some people say that it's like a bee sting, and locals have even told us that they've seen worm diggers crawling out of the mud flats and near tears from being bitten by these carnivorous worms. But there is one key piece of information that we learned from the original bloodworm video to today, and that is you can actually head a bloodworm. Similar to how a herpetologist would head a venomous snake to keep it from biting them, I will actually attempt to grab the proboscis once it shoots out and then intentionally inflict my first bite. And yes, I said first bite. There's gonna be more than one. Now what I'm going to try to do is head the proboscis and while I'm attempting to do this, let's review some of the most interesting facts about this bizarre marine oddity. The bloodworm is a venomous segmented worm that hunts invertebrates and other marine creatures. Armed with four razor sharp fangs, and a projectile mouth called a proboscis, they are voracious predators and are as aggressive as they are bizarre. One of the most shocking things about these worms is how normal they can appear and then in a split second transform into one of the most alien looking life forms you've ever seen. And as if this wasn't creepy enough, things get even worse. Once the blood worm has its prey ensnared in those hooked jaws, it will inject it with a paralyzing venom that incapacitates the victim so it can be digested and eaten a lot. This venom is chemically similar to that of a scorpion and is known to cause severe reactions in humans, including burning, tissue damage, and anaphylactic shock. Please do not attempt what you're about to see. Oh, almost got it. Ah, I missed it. Oh, good. oh, oh, come on. All right. I've got it. Oh, wants to bite me. That is the proboscis of one of the biggest blood worms I have ever seen. Holy moly, that's over a foot. 
for sure. Okay, time to get bitten by one of the only venomous worms on the planet, the blood worm. Got a good hold on it. Here we go. One, two, three. Look at that. Ah, he won't let go. Ah, he won't let go. Ah. Oh, he's in. Go, oh, he's really on there, guys. I can't get him off. Ah, he's biting me. Oh, he's got me good. Yeah, he got me. Ah, oh, man, it didn't break the skin. It was definitely latched into me, but its fangs I don't think are long enough to break the skin of my finger. I wonder if I try on a softer part. Let's try my wrist. It's a little bit thinner there, uh, a little bit softer. All right, here we go. Let's go in for the second bite on three. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yep, see him tug on the skin. Ah, oh, he's, he's, he's latched. He's latched. Ah, yeah. Mm. Oh, I can't get him off. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he's got me. You see that? Ah, oh, keep rolling, keep rolling. I'm gonna try to pry him off. Mm, he's really latched on. Mm. Come on, let go, let go. Ah, oh, he won't let go. Ah, oh, he won't let go. Gotta get him off. Ah. Oh. Oh yeah, that was a full on blood worm bite. Boy, that burns. Gosh, you get that shot? Got Those it. fangs were all the way latched in. Oh. Oh, oh that burns. Ooh, man, yes. You can see that there wasn't much blood produced from the bite, but I've got blisters forming and that's likely due to all the inflammation and swelling. I feel it in the nervous system. My wrist is screaming right now. Super painful burning sensation. A lot like a wasp or a bee sting. So those fangs are like little talons and it just grabbed right through the skin and did not want to let go. They were like barbs on a fishing hook. They were just in there. And really, I wasn't able to get the worm off until it decided to relax a little bit and I pried it back. But those fangs are definitely sharp enough Yikes, that hurt. Now that we've witnessed what a single blood worm is capable of, let's see what happens when I submerge my hands in over a hundred of them. Do blood worms hunt in packs? We're about to find out. Before I attempt to feed my hands to these four fang terrors, let's take a look at what they did to some normal prey from the wild. While related and very similar looking to blood worms, the sandworm is not nearly as formidable. And after a short time in a small aquarium, we can see they are also very much their food. The venomous bloodworms attacked and broke down the sandworms quickly. And what you're seeing now are signs of both chewing and dismemberment, a clear sign of active predation. If you thought one bloodworm bite was bad, oh. check this out. Whoa, look at all these worms. That is a container filled with over 100 blood worms in this tank. And I'm going to attempt to submerge my hands into this tank of blood worms for two minutes. All in an effort to figure out, do blood worms hunt in packs? Ready? On three. One, two, three. Oh, oh, that feels so weird. Ah, I just took my first bite. Hit, me on, the, hit me on the pinky. Mmm, oh. it was a bite and release. Oh, I could feel them. Uh, yeah, I could feel more proboscis going. It's like you could feel them tense up and then poof, it fires out. Ah, ah, the anticipation is killing me. You could see them wriggling. They, they have their little sensory tips sensing their environment for anything that they can eat or get those jaws on. Oh, I could see a lot of them are shooting their proboscis out already. They sense something foreign in their environment. I gotta look away. This is like too much anxiety just looking at this container. 
This has got to be the creepiest thing I have ever done in my entire life. Just so disgusting feeling all those worms wriggling around my fingers. One thing that we noticed earlier is that as soon as one of them fires their proboscis, it seems to create a rapid fire effect. They all do it at the same time. They're going crazy. They are. I feel them wriggling around my fingers. Oh man, oh yeah. Ah, got another one. Mm. Oh my goodness, so creepy. All right, how much time left? 30 seconds left. All right. This has got to be the longest two minutes of my life. Two minutes feels like an eternity. Ah. Oh. Oh. Oh, the bloodworm bite tank. Oh. This is horrible. Give me a countdown. Five. Ah, four, got me again. Three. That's three. Two. One. Ah. Oh. <sighs> Definitely got nailed on the pinky on this side. And I got two nips between my fingers here and here. Definitely got nipped three times. Wow, that was weird. What a crazy day on the Brave Wilderness Channel. Well, I don't know if we can definitively say that bloodworms like to hunt in packs, but I'll tell you this, they sure don't mind sharing a meal, but man, that original bite, that was a serious, serious chomp from a bloodworm. It is absolutely swollen and very, tender to the touch. I have a feeling I'm gonna be in pain for quite a while on that one. And I was absolutely correct. The bite of a bloodworm was no joke and ended up becoming one of the most painful experiences I've endured so far. Overnight, the swelling increased dramatically and the burning around the bite spread through my hand and up my arm, nearly locking my wrist. Then, Days after the initial pain subsided, I had a secondary reaction where the bite zone flared up with an aggressive rash and itched at least twice as much as poison ivy. In all, it took three weeks to heal from the bloodworm venom. And I'm here to officially say the scary rumors of bloodworms are 100% true. So while these creatures are an important part of the intertidal ecosystem and a valued resource for fishing towns across Maine, you absolutely want to avoid their bite at all costs. My name is Mark Vins. For over five years, 500 videos, You're right, man. and over a million miles traveled around the globe, I have been here with you on Brave Wilderness. And through those thousands upon thousands of hours off trail with my two best friends, I have witnessed some of the most amazing spectacles imaginable. I have stood amongst the shadows of mountains, of forests, of a cowboy hat, of some of the world's deadliest creatures, and most often, the shadow of my own camera. Then last year, I decided to step out and take my place in front of the lens to pursue my lifelong dream of ocean exploration. And since that day, there has been a singular entity an enigma that has drawn me back to the blue wilderness. But before I was to meet this creature of epic lore and mystery, I had to first pass a series of tests to prepare myself. There were tiger sharks, hammerheads, and deep water dives, and not simply for any certification, but to prove to myself to know that I was ready. Ready to meet my fate beneath the waves. Ready to come face to face with the great white shark. There it is. That's our ship. Today is the day we are here in Mexico about to go on our first ever great white shark adventure. Actually, I take that back. This is our second attempt. The first attempt didn't go as planned in the Farallon Islands, but I've got a feeling this one's gonna be a whole lot different. Upon leaving shore, I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Would this be a gateway to the next phase of my adventures? Or would this be my last? I am no stranger to risk. I have come face to face and hand to claw with some of the most ferocious and notorious animals on the planet. But this one was so much more. Inevitable, intentional, imperative to my quest as an explorer. Welcome to Guadalupe, a remote volcanic island 
175 nautical miles off the coast of Mexico's Baja Peninsula. This towering mountainous expanse of prehistoric Earth will serve as a backdrop to my greatest adventure to date. We made it. Because if there's one place on Earth to find the world's largest predatory shark, this is it. What's cool about Guadalupe is it's kind of like the sister to the Farallon Islands that we filmed at before. Unfortunately, we didn't see any sharks in the Farallons, but down here, the sharks come in because of the seals. They have three different species of pinniped here in Guadalupe. They've got their endemic fur seal population, they've got California sea lions, and then of course they have northern elephant seals, all of which are on the menu for the great white shark. And the place we are at right now is known as the kill zone. This is the space between the feeding grounds where the seals need to hunt their food and the shore where they rest during the day. And as you can imagine, in that space in between is the great white shark's favorite buffet. But our goal isn't to see seals getting eaten while we're out here. Our goal is to get under the water in the realm of the great white shark so we can get the cameras up close and personal with one of the world's top marine predators. Our home in this mystical place will be none other than the Socorro Vortex of the Pelagic Fleet. This ship and its crew have been making the voyage to Guadalupe for years and have been assisting in shark research and conservation all along the way. The very first step to try to protect sharks it's to get in the water with them. Once you're in the water with them, it's a completely different perspective you will get forever. So one of the biggest differences between what we tried to do in the Farallon Islands and what we're doing out here in Guadalupe is this. We actually get to use a tractant, AKA bait, to draw on the sharks close to the cages and therefore up close to the cameras. All right guys, I think it's time to get suited up because it's about to be our turn to get in the water. As I began to suit up, reality sunk in. I do need to say, this is the point where the nerves start to kick in. And it's not because I'm scared, it's not out of fear, it's healthy because an activity like this is not risk-free. Even though we're with one of the best crews in the world when it comes to diving in cages with great white sharks, we still have to have our wits about us. Anything can happen. We're talking a ton plus animal that can be ferocious in a moment's notice. And they can literally rip these cages apart. In fact, one of my friends caught footage of a shark entering a shark cage and they had to pop the top where the divers are supposed to come out to release the shark, not the diver. So we definitely have to keep our eyes peeled, be aware at all times, watch each other's backs when we're in the cages because literally anything can happen. Just because there's bars in front of us, that's not any sign for complacency when you're in the water with an animal that formidable. The few steps between the deck and the shark cage created a bridge to the world of the great white. My heart began to race, but this time the nerves I felt were more distinct. This was an adrenaline rush from the excitement of a life's dream nearing closer with each and every step. My moment had finally arrived. Here we go. As I entered the cool 65 degree water, my eyes began to adjust and I became aware of the endless blue void that lurked below me. The sunlight danced through the 12,000 feet of water surrounding the landscape of the island, and there was no bottom in sight, meaning the sharks could be anywhere and come from any direction. Looking around, scanning for our first shark, I was in awe of the clarity of the water and the abundance of fish in the area. Our main challenge at this point was getting properly positioned. The strong currents threw us around the cages like ragdolls. So to keep the camera steady and our bodies from bouncing off the walls, we fixed our feet to the railing and held tightly with our free hands. Watching from below the surface, I could see the occasional splash from above as the crew tossed bait lines into the water. Knowing full well that each attempt could be the line to draw the apex predators from below. We waited patiently scanning the blue abyss for any shadows or signs of movement. Minutes seemed like hours, but then, without much warning, it happened. From the distance, a dark shape began to appear. It crept toward us slowly, and then suddenly, it was right in front of us. Wow, I couldn't believe my eyes. What I've been witnessing for years on Shark Week was right in front of my lens. Finally, I was in the presence of a great white shark. It thrashed toward the bait and missed, but after a quick lap around our cage, it disappeared again. 
As fast as the giant flashed into view, it was gone. But this was proof of victory. We were going to be seeing sharks today, and hopefully, lots of them. On average, great white sharks will have up to 300 teeth in their mouths at any given time. And these teeth are arranged in up to seven rows, with the first two known as their working teeth. As you can see by our footage, their attacks are calculated and precise. The torpedo shape of their body allows the great white to accelerate up to speeds of, get this, 35 miles an hour and strike with a force of 29 Gs. So forget about the bite for a second. The impact alone is enough to kill prey all by itself. As I calmly observe the frenzy of sharks surrounding the cage, I am reminded that I am in their world. Not only am I observing them, they are observing me. Witnessing a strange visitor in a metal cage, they would come closer and closer with each pass for a better look. And locking eyes with a great white shark is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. As my time in the cage came to a close, I couldn't help but keep my camera rolling. We had seen many impressive sharks today, but I just had this feeling that something big was about to happen. When suddenly, a giant silhouette charged from straight beneath, and with its sights locked on the prize, it lunged at full kill speed. And pow! I could not believe it. It's rare to see from the surface, let alone from underwater, but what we had just witnessed was a full breach. Behold, the full fury of the great white shark. Now feeling extremely happy with our footage, and after hours underwater, it was finally time to return to the safety of the boat. Woo! Oh my goodness, what an epic great white shark adventure that was. For our very first one, I don't think we could have asked for any more. The surface cages did not disappoint. We had all kinds of action. We had encounters right at the cage. We had fights at the bait. We had surface breaches. Huge thanks to the Socorro Vortex crew for helping us out and keeping us safe on today's adventure. It's no surprise that these sharks are referred to as great. They are truly a perfected product of evolution and largely differ from any of the previous sharks we've encountered on Blue Wilderness. Great whites are intelligent creatures highly inquisitive by nature, and as we clearly witnessed today, master hunters of the deep. We'd like to give an extra special thank you to the captain and crew of the Socorro Vortex. To learn more about the ways you can visit Guadalupe or to support shark conservation, please visit their website at www.vortexliveaboard.com. Over the years, Costa Rica has been one of our favorite countries in the tropics to visit. The diversity of animal species that can be encountered in just a few hundred square meters of rainforest, especially at night, is incredible to witness. We have come across some of Costa Rica's most charismatic species, while others have been quite camera shy. Some species we set out to find and spend countless hours searching for. There he is. Look at that little guy. While others, to our great surprise, spontaneously appeared right before our very eyes. I was expecting creepy crawlies, not something as cute. Oh, as an ocelot. <laughs> you? There is one species, however, that has always managed to elude us on every one of our expeditions to Central America. On one of our most recent trips, we even dedicated an entire night searching for this reptile in a specific area that had reports of recent sightings. But the terrain thoroughly exhausted us in our efforts proved to be fruitless. The ground is super muddy. You can see the mud all over my boots. It's basically like ice skating up and down mountainsides. It's super tiring. It takes about a step and a half for every regular step you'd have on flat ground. So yeah, it's tough work. The following morning, however, we received an unexpected call. Our target species was found on a private property a few hours away. The landowner wanted to relocate it for fear it would bite one of his workers. Without hesitation, we set off to encounter a snake the locals call Matabui, the ox killer, or commonly known as the Bushmaster.
Our goal would be to assist in the relocation process, but also assess the health of this snake before release at a wildlife reserve. The potentially lethal reputation of this snake required my full attention. The following scenes are a bit of a blur to me. This was my first time handling a Bushmaster, and addressing the camera in the moment was not my first priority. But the crew still grabbed the cameras to document this unexpected experience. We used a standard snake bag to transport the snake safely to the preserve, and from there, cautiously coaxed the snake out. Snakes will often feel secure in a dark, confined location, like a snake bag, and may not exit immediately. Oh boy. Using my snake handling tools to avoid a bite through the bag, I was able to open the bag and reveal the snake. Whoa. There's the Bushmaster. Yep. That's a big snake. Oh my goodness. All right. So far, so good. Overall, the animal looks fairly healthy. The first thing I noticed was this creature's eyes. They may look frightening, but it is simply an indication that the snake had entered a shed cycle. As a snake prepares to shed its old outer layer of scales, lubricant will accumulate underneath to help slough off the scales easier. The resulting blue color of the eye is actually this fluid building up underneath the protective eye caps that covers a snake's lidless eyes. Is that good or bad for us? Well, sometimes they get a little cranky when they're gonna shed. The way I like to think about it is, when snakes are in shed, as we refer to it, they're kind of having a bad hair day. But as of right now, this animal is behaving very well. And I want to do as little handling as possible, especially if it's just kind of motionless like this. Okay. As long as you react slow, gentle with your movements, the snake should be fine. The snake is gonna react when we react. Secondly, I could tell there was a minor scrape on the snake's snout and mouth region, but this should heal just fine as the snake goes through its shed cycle and a new layer of skin is formed. One of the most distinguishing features of this snake genus, Lachesis, is the heavily keeled pyramid-like scales that run along the length of the body and form a dorsal ridge, giving the snake a rough and textured look. By the length of the tail, I think this is a female. Really? Yep. Okay. Females have a kind of shorter, stockier tail. Most pit vipers give birth to live young. Bushmasters actually lay eggs, a very unique feature for a pit viper. What's really cool about Bushmasters as well is that males tend to get larger than females. In general, in the snake world, it's usually opposite. Bushmasters are considered the largest pit viper in the world, and this species has the potential to reach 12 feet in length. This Bushmaster was about seven feet, a good average size for a snake in this region, indicating it is likely a mature individual. Although the venom of the Bushmaster is not considered the most toxic in the region, the massive quantity of venom that a large snake could inject would be lethal. The venom is composed of hemotoxic properties which can cause severe necrosis of muscle tissues and affect blood clotting factors. Several fatalities have occurred from Bushmaster bites even after the administration of anti-venom, which means I have no room for error while working with this snake. Oh my goodness, Mario, I just got that shot. What just happened? It actually kind of yawned and fixed one of its fangs. It's that... not uncommon for snakes like that to do that. <laughs> that fang was huge. Wow. I was wondering if we were gonna get to see those fangs. That is a sight that you rarely will ever see, the fangs of a Bushmaster. That was pretty cool. <laughs> wow, I'm speechless. At a few points during the assessment process, the snake actually opened its mouth in a yawn-like fashion, exposing its long hinged fangs. This might look menacing or even threatening, but it was simply the snake realigning its fangs, which are kept folded against the upper jaw when the mouth is closed. It was definitely a unique opportunity witnessing the fangs of the snake without being in the bite zone. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> I want to capture that. That is pretty cool. A behavior like this is something we could have never predicted to see. But my experience has taught me to always be prepared for the unexpected. 
This was by far one of the most intimidating snakes I have worked with. Not necessarily because of her temperament or behavior, but simply because of her size and my knowledge of the associated risks of receiving a bite. Well, you know, obviously <laughs> both Mario and I are super excited and humbled by the fact we're getting to witness this snake. It would have been cool to find our own Bushmaster, but I feel super proud to be part of this relocation process, the part of this opportunity for the snake to avoid a potential bad situation and be relocated to a place that it can live out the rest of its life on protected land. I think that speaks to the core of what Brave Wilderness stands for and the conservation efforts that we support. Absolutely. You know, this is a female. This is a mature female that in a population is very important, right? She's going to give birth to the next generation of Bushmasters. So any Bushmaster that can be saved is fantastic for the population. And how cool. Last night in Costa Rica, and we finally get a Bushmaster up close for the cameras. Quick little fist bump. <laughs> After this quick health assessment, the snake was released deep within the protected reserve, far away from any human habitation. And even though this was not exactly the encounter I had been hoping for, it was still an amazing opportunity to work with the species. However, this infamous reptile still eludes us in the wild. The secretive nature of this animal and its preferred habitat of undisturbed dense lowland rainforests, along with decreasing population densities throughout its range, make it extremely difficult to find. But our search is far from over. Big day for Brave Wilderness. I'm about to attempt to film the real life Godzilla on the shores of an active volcano in the middle of the Galapagos. But to do that, I will need to dive under those crashing waves if I want to get up close to the only lizard on the planet that navigates the ocean, the marine iguana. Hostile forces of nature. The famous words of Darwin describe the Galapagos perfectly, and that's exactly what we're up against. Filming marine iguanas in action means we will need to scuba dive through shark-filled waters, avoid ripping ocean currents, and brave relentless tidal surges that will throw us around like ragdolls. All right, so as we make our way to the intertidal zone, you can begin to see what we're going to contend with. As a scuba diver, if we get caught in these breakers, it could be game over, but it's what it's gonna take if we wanna get up close to those iconic marine iguanas. All right, we have to dive deep quickly to avoid the current. All divers on today's mission are carrying emergency GPS beacons in case one of us gets pulled out to sea. It's critical we remain close together as we make our way toward the iguana feeding grounds. Visibility will change frequently, and there will be many twists and turns to navigate. The water here is very cold, only 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also high in nutrients, which attracts more than just iguanas. The Galapagos has one of the most biodiverse marine systems on the planet, making it a critical front line of conservation. But there's no time to waste. We need to save as much air as possible to film the iguanas. The surge will only get stronger the shallower we go. It's almost like the ocean is breathing. Push, calm, pull. Push, calm, pull. This is the most turbulent water I have ever experienced, and it's making it hard to stay submerged. But surfacing now could roll us into the breaking waves, which would be very dangerous and potentially a life-threatening scenario. Only 50 yards from shore, this is where we need to be. And there it is, our first iguana. What you are looking at is one of the most specialized lizards on the planet, and the only one that spends time in the ocean. The marine iguana. If there were ever a living version of Godzilla, this is it. In fact, one of the common names for them on San Cristobal Island is the Godzilla iguana. Check out that scientific name. It turns out Godzilla is now a real animal. 
Filming these iguanas is going to be a real test. Luckily, the rocks down here are only covered in plants, so unlike coral, it's okay for us to carefully hold on with our gloves. But the surge is intense, making it nearly impossible to hold on when it rips through. Periods of calm will be our only chance to get close to the iguanas. But make no mistake, the surge will return. Luckily, the iguanas seem laser focused on feeding, almost ignoring our presence. Clearly, every bite counts when you're braving these conditions. Marine iguanas are herbivores that have adapted many specializations to help them survive at sea for the sole purpose of finding food. The rocks here are covered in a leafy marine salad that includes red and green algae, a favorite of the marine iguana, and one of the only reliable food sources for them in the Galapagos. To get it, they have to sometimes dive 60 feet and hold their breath for up to 30 minutes. They use their hooked, talon-like claws to grip onto the rocks, while their shortened snout allows them to get their teeth closer and into tight spaces to chop away at the algae. So their Godzilla-like appearance does serve a survival purpose. Marine iguanas have also developed flattened tails that are muscular and help them swim through this hazardous environment. And as much as they need their swimming ability to dive into the ocean, it's the getting back to land when it really comes into play. Unlike us, the iguanas are able to swim right into the breakers and body surf their way back to land. Their ability to navigate the bone-crushing waves is unbelievable. But of course, they saved their final and most impressive adaptation for the shore. Because these iguanas feed on plants full of salt water, they have remarkably evolved glands that absorb the salt to be ejected by way of snot rockets, also called wigs, and while it seems gross, it's very efficient and just another unlikely demonstration of how these iguanas have solved the many problems to exist here in the Galapagos. Contrary to their name, marine iguanas spend most of their lives on land. The shores of Fernandina can be stacked with hundreds of basking lizards. And while only adult iguanas dive for food, you can spot subadults and juveniles foraging in the tide pools or just at the water's edge. Large male iguanas are very territorial and can be seen sparring or using head bobs to push off competing males from the rest of the breeding population. Before they branched off to explore the waters of the intertidal zone, marine iguanas started as a land-based species, only driven below the ocean surface due to what must have been an extreme lack of food. In fact, in the Galapagos today, there are three distinct species of iguana that are all descendants of a common land ancestor, one of which is the rarest lizard on the planet and the one that brought us to the Galapagos in the first place. The interconnection between land and sea is unmistakable in the Galapagos. And as an ambassador for rewild.org, we are working together with the Galapagos National Park to ensure this marine reserve is expanded and remains protected for generations to come. There is no better example to the importance of these two worlds 
than the marine iguana, which is unique to the Galapagos and the only lizard on Earth that has adapted for life in the ocean. The fact they have evolved to survive these hostile forces of nature is truly incredible. That was such a fun dive. That was the coolest scuba diving I've ever done in my entire life. Took everything we had to stay in position and to roll with the surge back and forth. It was surreal. It was like living inside the cover of a National Geographic magazine. Iceland, a country sprawling with dramatic landscapes and explosive volcanic terrain. A place that truly embodies the meaning of the word adventure with every vista and every step forth on its craggy soil. That's a volcano. Just erupted eight years ago. For me, this would be my first visit to the Nordic island nation that is far more green than its northern neighbor of Greenland. However, this would be no traditional adventure. It was a solo mission. My goal, to scout future expeditions and adventures for Coyote and the crew, a mission I have led myself many times in the past. Remember those dinosaur footprints? Yep. I found those months earlier on a scouting expedition in southern Utah. But now, because of advancements in camera technology, I can take you with me on these exciting and often unexpected adventures. Here we go. Time to go snorkeling in freezing water. Let's do this. While on my Icelandic journey, I explored places like the Valley of Thor, rode Icelandic horses, and even got to visit a world-famous spa, the Blue Lagoon. I still don't know what that is on my face, but hey, everyone was doing it, so why not? Anyways, there's one particular adventure on this expedition that I simply couldn't wait to show you. That being my journey into the icy waters of the Silfra Fissure. The fissure itself is a byproduct of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates drifting apart, leaving in their wake multiple rifts that fill with some of the purest water on the planet. All right, guys, we're about to go snorkeling in the Silfra Fissure, some of the clearest water visibility in all the world and actually one of the only places that you can dive between two continents. Literally, we are standing in the fissure that separates Eurasia and North America right now, and we're gonna go diving in a natural spring. So it's very cold. We definitely don't want water getting inside our suits because it's around two degrees Celsius, just above freezing, but it's gonna be pretty awesome. We're about to go get our snorkel gear together and uh, get in, so let's go. Is that graceful? Look good? No? Okay. Well, it's gonna keep you warm, so that's what's important. As I walked down the steps of the platform, a nervous anticipation started to set in. Entering 36 degree Fahrenheit water isn't something I tend to do every day. I mean, this water is only four degrees above freezing. Safe to say, it doesn't get much colder than this. So guys, my sister's helping us out today. Say hi to everybody, Vic. She came to Iceland with me. So she's the cameraman today. But here we go. We're gonna go snorkeling in the Silfra Fisher. Time to get in. As I plunged into the water, my face was instantly met with a stinging sensation. The shock distracted me, but then suddenly, an explosion of color. This landscape was absolutely surreal, something straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel. And to top it all off, the water was 100% crystal clear. It was nearly unbelievable. The visibility in the fissure on a good day is said to extend well beyond 300 feet. And I think we can all look at this footage and confirm that that is definitely true. I can see now why so many people with the fear of heights have issues with this experience. It literally felt as if nothing was between me and the bottom of the fissure. In fact, the sensation was actually closer to that of flying than it was to swimming. That is, until I tried to actually kick with my fins. The dry suit, while providing life-saving warmth and insulation, made it nearly impossible to move. The buoyancy it created restricted my movement so much that to a large degree, I was only able to move forward by the assistance of the current. However, I will say this lack of mobility actually allowed me to relax, 
and enjoy the experience as a whole and really take in all the color and spectacular scenery. Sometimes it's nice to just be along for the ride. So how does a place like the Silfra Fisher come to exist? Well, as it turns out, Iceland sits smack dab on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is formed by the separation of the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. In Thingvellir National Park, the separation of these plates expands nearly one inch every year. But over the course of millions of years, it has created fissures, which are filled by a natural aquifer and glacial meltwater from the surrounding peaks. This water moves slowly, very slowly. In fact, it can take up to nearly 100 years to travel and filter itself through the porous volcanic soil, making it some of the purest H2O on the planet. It is so pure, you can literally drink the water around you as you swim through the fissure. And yes, I definitely tried it out. Ooh, well, the water is cold. But I can tell you guys, this is by far the clearest visibility I have ever encountered. And oh, by the way, the water is delicious. It's about the purest water that you could ever drink. So it is one of those scenarios where you can't drink the water. It's pretty awesome. Iceland. While it is delicious, it is actually the purity and frigid temperature of the water that helps to create the vivid colors in the landscape of this environment. As I continued to drift along, I couldn't help but dream of coming back to dive this location with the team. My imagination was literally running wild, trying to picture what the scene must be like from the bottom of the fissure. And I was also beginning to wonder, what else might live down there? Is there something down there besides algae and troll grass? But just as I started to consider the idea of taking a free dive to find out, I noticed the battery on my GoPro, which was full 20 minutes prior, was now at only 1%. Wow, guys, the water is so cold that it's literally draining the life out of this GoPro. But before it dies, I just want to say that getting to circle the Sofra Fisher here in Iceland has to be one of the coolest experiences I've ever done. It's hot out here, Corey. Have you ever been inside a volcano before? I have not. Okay, neither have I. This is going to be a first for the Brave crew. The sand that's all around us right now is how this entire valley started. That's why the rock formations are here. This was once called the Ancient Desert Sand Sea. But over millions of years, the sand hardened into the rock and the sandstone that we see here before us with the wind and the water shaping all of the sweeping textures that make it so iconic. Now, this volcano erupted 27,000 years ago. So we're gonna see a lot of stuff like this, basalt blown out of the volcano and landed miles away. Looks like we got a little bit further to go before we get to the lava field, but man, I'm excited. This is an Adventures with me or the books. Straight ahead. It's got to be. It's got to be right up here. Let's go. Oh man, this is cool. Ho oh, ho! That's the lava tube. You can see it's coming up from the earth right there. And a lava tube is pretty much a volcano's drainage pipe. When magma rises to the surface, there's a cap and that cap pressurizes the magma. It spreads that magma out underneath the ground forming lava tubes just like this. It is very precarious in here. You can see that the walls are all fractured already. This makes me a little bit nervous. Usually when your gut gives you that feeling like maybe you shouldn't go too much further. That's a good warning to heed, but oh my gosh, this even goes further. If you're brave enough, I guess you could explore through these lava tubes, but I'm not sure. It's a very good idea. I think that's enough lava tube adventuring for me today. I'm gonna get back on the surface. Not a cloud in sight today. It is a bluebird sky, which means that the sun is gonna punish us. Every step is well earned out here. All right, there it is. There's our path through. This is how we're gonna get up and over this range of sandstone. If you guys are ready, we got one last heave before we see the volcano. Oh, we're gonna get scraped up. This stuff is sharp. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is it's opening up a lot. The bad news is it's getting really steep. And this is what we call scrambling. It's not walking, it's not rock climbing, it's scrambling. Gotta use your hands, gotta use your feet, gotta wedge your body in between places for more support. And it happens to be a lot of fun. As tiring as it is, I'm really enjoying this. Man, I tell you what, if I was a mountain lion, 
That's what I would be calling home right there. Don't look down now. There it is. This is so cool. That's the volcano. Surrounded by white sandstone. All right, I think this is where we start making our ascent. I can see the grades getting pretty steep. Probably why they say this trail is for advanced hikers only. Now, volcanoes like this one are known as cinder cone volcanoes. The reason they are called that is because not only are they in the shape of a cone, but when the lava explodes, it does so in very fine fragments like this right here. These are cinders and clinkers. The clinkers have a funny name for a reason. And actually when they roll down hills, they clink. That is why it's called a clinker. Pretty cool, huh? Oh man. Corey, how we doing back there? Okay, legs are on fire. We've come a long way, look how far. Down from that valley, over that mountain, and then right here to where we're standing. Certainly a full day of adventuring. We're about to see what's waiting on the other side. All right, there it goes. Whoa, there it is. We made it. That's the crater. How cool was this, Corey? One of my favorite expeditions we've done yet. We've taken you on all these wildlife adventures over the years, and we thought it was time to show you what else was out there. So many places on this planet to explore, and we're gonna take you with us every step of the way. But, Corey, if I'm not mistaken, we have a few more steps left. Let's go down in the crater. Wow, not even to the bottom, and it is already an incredible view. Very slippery, very hazardous. Definitely bring your hiking boots if you go on one of these adventures. <laughs> Just like that. Yes! I just gotta, gotta take a moment and just soak this in. Here we are. We made it to the finale of today's adventure inside the cinder cone volcano here at Snow Canyon State Park. And now it's time to answer the burning question. I'm sure you're all wondering, Mark, are you and Corey in any danger standing inside the crater of this volcano? No, we're not. And the reason for that is because this volcano is extinct, no longer posing a threat for an eruption. Now, that's not true with all volcanoes. So if you're gonna go on an adventure like this somewhere else in the world, other than this park, be sure to check out if it's an active volcano or not and be sure to check with the park services first because some volcanoes are very, very, very dangerous and we hate for anyone at home to go on an adventure that got themselves hurt. But this adventure was absolutely epic. If I don't mind saying so myself, we made it to the center of a volcano for the very first time on Brave Wilderness and I hope you guys enjoy this expedition. I'm Mark Vins, be brave, stay wild. We'll see you guys on the next adventure.